your advice is not nearly as good as you think it is. And if you're thinking to yourself, oh, no, no, Michael, no, no, my advice is magnificent. Well, I'd encourage you to go watch all those TED videos on cognitive biases. They will explain just how bad your advice normally is, particularly if you think you give good advice. Oh, that was wonderful. That's pretty funny, particularly because we're here to give some people some good advice. So there's a certain irony in playing that. But, you know, Marshall, I tell you, my favorite comment on that TEDx talk when you go to the YouTube session is somebody posted early on, I tried to watch this, but his trousers were too tight. I, like, <laughs> I feel like I've really made it when I'm like, my trousers are too tight. So I'm wearing very tight trousers right now, but because of the videoing, you, you can't see that. You can just see my shirt. So anyway, it's nice to be here with you. <laughs> well, let's get rolling. I'm Marshall Goldsmith. I'm an executive educator. I'm a coach. I'm an author. I'm here with one of the great authors and coaches, both Michael Bungay. Michael, a wonderful guy. Thinkers 50 did the top eight coaches in the world. And the only person to be on that list twice was you. That's right. Well, that was a high compliment, you know, and uh, and and two brilliant win winners from that as well. I mean, just two percent of me wanted to 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 be the person who won that prize, but ninety eight percent of me was like, you know what? In in uh, the two two women who won that prize, you got two great champions for people oh, yeah. really leading coaching into the into the future in the twenty first century. So, anyway, it's nice to be here with you, Marshall. You're an old friend, so it's nice to hang out here. Ah, oh, you're a wonderful friend. And by the way, look, being in the top eight in the world in anything, yeah. is pre it's pretty good. It is a big <laughs> world out there. So you know, good. being in the top eight in the world twice, that's that's okay. I think uh, we're, I can. I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> let's just, let's just declare victory. And by the way, in terms of coaching book sales, I think your book is the biggest. Specifically, like I wrote a book called "What Got You Here Won't Get You There." But that's not specifically about coaching. Yeah, in terms of a book specifically about coaching. I would be willing to bet your book is the biggest selling book in history about coaching. Well, wow. uh, thank you. It's certainly going to be one of the top few. I mean, it's sold more than a million copies now. So I'm pretty, yeah. I mean, that's, <laughs> I mean, you've sold, you've, you've had a couple of books that have passed or maybe three books that have passed a million mark. And that's really hard to do. <laughs> so um, you, you need a good book and you need timing and you need fairy dust <laughs> and you need all of that. And somehow, I got lucky with the coaching habit. So it's amazing to watch that still be the number one coaching book on Amazon at the moment. Uh, it's a wonderful book. And let's talk, speaking of books, that's what we're here to talk about today. I have your new book. You can't see it very well, but it's called How to Begin. That How is very to begin. Good. Look, another great effort from you. Let me give you a few things I love about your books, period. One is they're concise. They're not excessively wordy. You don't pontificate. They give you specific ideas, things you can act on immediately, and they're fun. They're not, they're kind of, you're, you're always a little uh, irreverent, and <laughs> I think that's a, a very positive quality. So I'm Thank just going to ask you a few questions about the book, and then we'll just shoot the breeze. Are we Love ready? That. Bring it on, Marshall, and thanks for the nice words. Question number one. Oh, what do people get wrong about setting goals? Ah, uh, Yeah. You know, I started writing this book and I didn't think it was going to be about goal setting. I didn't think it was going to be centered on that. I thought it was going to be another crack at trying to figure out what does it take to change? Because behavior change, which is the work we do as educators and as facilitators and as coaches, as everybody knows, is, is a tricky thing. I'm like, I'd love to try and simplify that and make that more practical. And it turned out that I, I tried to write that book. <laughs> I, sent it, I sent a draft off to a friend. And he went, Michael, I've read 50 pages of your book. It makes no sense to me whatsoever. I was like, okay, I need to go back and take another crack at this. And when I, when I looked at the rubble of that first draft, there was one phrase that really stood out. We unlock our greatness by working on the hard things. So it occurred to me that I was like, I want to help people work on the hard things, things that are thrilling and important and daunting for them so they can set a worthy goal. And as I thought that through in my head, it wasn't quite as fast as that, but it kind of came to me. It occurred to me that the way we often set goals at the moment basically don't work that well. They drive me nuts. I mean, lots of people are familiar with the idea of a smart goal. Yeah, and Sure, there's a place for smart goals, but 
when you think of all the acronyms as smart, specific, measurable, actionable, timely, and so on, it's all about kind of tidying things up. It's all about reducing the goal, kind of clarifying where the edges are. And if you, if you don't have the right goal, you can very easily have a smart goal that is just working on the wrong thing. And then the other thing that people have heard about is BHAGs, big, hairy, audacious goals. And I, I like those. But mostly when those are talked about, they're talked about in the context of organizations. You know, they come from Jim Collins's work and good to great. Right. So either it's the goal is way too big and it's too abstract and it's big and it's hairy and it's almost impossible, or it's smart, which means it's, it's tightly measured, but it might not be the right thing. And I wanted to fill the gap. And that's what a worthy goal does. It's a goal that lights you up. It's a goal that contributes to the world. And it's a goal that teaches you. It's daunting. It pushes you to the edge of your own learning capabilities. Yeah, I was going to ask you, what are the three core elements of a goal? But I think you just told me what they are. <laughs> yeah, well, let me dig into it a little bit, because I think it's useful for people just to hear a bit more about it. Thrilling is the first one. So yeah. thrilling you get. You're like, you know, you rub your hands together and go, I'd be up for that. That sounds exciting. That's actually what I want to do. And it speaks to your values, your commitment and your passions and who you are now and who you want to be when you grow up. But Marshall, one of the powerful things about naming the thrillingness of it is it works as a counteraction to the sense of obligation. You know, and I know you've worked with you know hundreds of people that you've coached and worked with. And certainly at a certain time, people often feel obliged and kind of, I should be doing this or I ought to be doing that. Or, right. you know, in this position, it's about time that I, and we inherit goals, right. either internally driven or externally driven that actually we don't really want. So that's thrilling, kind of counteracts that. If your goal was only thrilling, I think you run into the danger of it being the kind of the worst of the self-help, which is it's just a bit too self-indulgent. It's all about me, me, me. Right. Because there's a place for that. But right. I want people to make this world better than it is right now. As somebody once said, I want you to figure out how you give more to the world than you take. And the important thing is about pushing into that bigger picture, which is like, how is this contributing to my family or my team or my community or my neighborhood or my movement or my organization? How do I make sure that it's not just about what I want, but it's also about what we need? Right. And then daunting, we've talked about, which is like, okay, <laughs> how do you get out of that comfort place that you're in and step out to the edge of your confidence and your confidence so that you unlock your greatness by working on the stuff that's new and difficult for you. Yeah, I, I, I like this because to me, as I look at what you've written and I think about it and I think about the people I coach, mm. um, sometimes I think they get lost in daunting. Right. I better say which one gets overweighted, that would be it. They're so focused on achieving goals Right. They get to what I call goal addiction or, you know, goal, goal achievement addiction. And right. the problem is if all you focus on is achievement right. after you achieve something, what do you do then? Right. Well, by definition, achievement, there's a finish line. <laughs> That's well, exactly okay, right. What happens after you cross the damn finish line? You're finished. <laughs> You're well, finished, right? I, I, I totally agree with you. And in fact, in some ways, this whole conversation about goals is a little bit of misdirection on my part. Yeah. That phrase, we unlock our greatness by working on the hard things, isn't we unlock our greatness by finishing the fin crossing the finish line and picking up the trophy. Right. It's, it's in doing the work that actually the magic happens. And, you know, if you're lucky, you do cross finish lines and you go, that's great. And you celebrate the moment and you have that achievement, mm -hmm. but it can be that you're, you're on a, you know, they call it the hedonic treadmill. You know, you're endlessly right. chasing something. You've never got enough. You're never satisfied. You're an empty ghost. Right. That, that's not the, the, the recipe for a happy life. But finding something thrilling, important, and daunting, and then committing to it and doing the work and seeing, you know, blisters on your hands and kind of growth in your heart, there's something magical about that. I, I love that. Now, how do you test each of the three elements? Yeah. So... One of the successes of the coaching habit book was one of the questions, I called it the focus question, which is, so what's the real challenge here for you? 
And it just has a key insight that coaches will be familiar with, which is the first challenge that people pull up is almost never the real challenge or never the only challenge. It's worth staying curious a little bit longer so you can kind of poke at that challenge. And actually in goal setting, it's similar, which is like, look, the first time you define a goal, don't be fooled into thinking that that's the best version of your goal. A goal strengthens if you draft it and redraft it and you test it and you kind of do all you can to make sure it is optimal for you around thrilling, important, and daunting. So I came up with three tests to help you kind of work through the drafting process. Test number one, this is really good for thrilling. I call it the spouse-ish test. And if you're lucky in your life, you have somebody who is a deep, trusted friend, somebody who really knows you, somebody who really gets you. In my case, I'm about to celebrate 30 years with my wife, Marcella. So she's my person. She's a spouse. But not everybody has a spouse or not everybody's spouse plays that role for them. But you want somebody who knows you, who gets you, who sees your patterns, who laughs at your jokes, who kind of has your back. And the spouse test is this. You, you go and imagine or actually tell your spouse person the worthy goal that you've drafted for yourself. And you, and you, you test their reaction. Is it a, is it a yes Michael, that's amazing. You should definitely do that. Is it a yes, but Michael, stop talking about it because you've been talking about it for five years now and I want you to get off your ass and get on with it? Yeah. Or is it a no, don't do that. That's a terrible idea, Michael. You should definitely not do that. And it doesn't really matter what their response is because whatever their response is, it's data. It's triangulation for you to kind of figure out how does this goal fit with me? So that's the first test, the spouse-ish test. The second test is really good for the important element. And I call this the FOSO test. And FOSO isn't a cool place in New York where you live. It's, uh, it stands for for the sake of. And so this is where you look at your goal and you go, well, for the sake of what will I be doing this? And it's a way of you connecting to that bigger picture, that bigger act of service around how mm -hmm. does this actually serve something that I care about? And then the third test is the Goldilocks test. And well, the Goldilocks zone test, I should call it. And the Goldilocks zone is an idea out of astronomy. So one of the cool things about astronomy, Marshall, is that, you know, they have the capacity now to look at distant stars and, and kind of find planets around those stars. They've kind of right. managed to do that in the last 10 years. Right. In the last six months, they found the first planet outside our galaxy, which is pretty amazing, 23 million light years away. And... As exciting as a planet is, even more exciting is if that planet is in the Goldilocks zone. Because the Goldilocks zone is when it's not so hot that all the water evaporates and it's not so cold that all the water freezes, but it's right. that place where water is liquid, just like it is here on our planet. Right. Because liquid water means life, or at least the potential for life. Right. So with the Goldilocks zone test, you're really asking yourself, does this goal have the right heft? Not too big, not too small not too hot, not too cold? Does it feel like I know how to start it, even if I don't quite know how to finish it? Right. You, you know, I I like this Goldilocks zone chart. <laughs> so I'm looking at it right now. You know, is right. it too overwhelming, too big, too easy, too small, too heavy? Where is it just about right? Is it just about exactly. right? Now you well, mentioned, okay. There it is. Yeah, I, 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 I like this sure. chart. And now you mentioned, you know, earlier that big, hairy, audacious goals. I, I never yeah. like to say bad things about anyone. But to me, that was one of the more nonsense things I've ever read. <laughs> Let me tell you why. I'll, yeah. I'll, and I'll break, I'll break my rule twice by saying something bad about another book that sold more books than you and me ever combined. It's called The Secret. Oh. Now, the, the Secret to me is one of the most ridiculous books ever written. Oh, I couldn't yeah, agree it, more. It drives me nuts. That if book. you envision it, it will happen. Right. Now, I have the unfortunate curse of being rational, right? <laughs> and, and so if I envision it, it will happen. Well, you know, this is called, from a mathematic point of view, the, the survivor bias. Exactly. So they interview people who are successful. And they say, Jim did this, and Jim is successful. Therefore, if you do this, you will be successful. No. Yeah. Every waitress in Hollywood has a big, hairy, audacious goal. Exactly. And you know what? I live here in Nashville. Every waitress in Nashville wants to be a country music star. They all have big, hairy, audacious goals. In fact, your odds on achieving a goal, if you set this ridiculous, audacious goal, are not higher. They get close to zero. 
<laughs> because we you know what? There's an irony here, Marshall. Actually, the science tells us that if you spend too much time envisioning the goal, yeah, your brain becomes less motivated. Yeah. The brain can't quite figure out the difference between in your head and outside your head. Yeah. So if you spend your whole time imagining the outcome, your brain goes, you kind of got this. So we don't even need to work at it. So no, this no. is this kind of commitment back to define your goal, but the magic's in the process. The magic's doing the work. Yeah, I, I like this because it's realistic. And, you know, the reality is somebody's going to be a movie star, but not too many. Right, exactly. Not, 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 not too many are going to be movie stars, right? And, yeah. uh, you know, for every waitress there in Hollywood, I mean, my, in my little neighborhood, Taylor Swift lives across the street, and I got Nick, and I got the Keith Urban living down the street, the guy from Rascal Flats. But you know what? I don't think too many of the waitresses are going to be moving into the hood. So, you know, it's I, what I'm really waiting for is the release of your country and Western record, you know, your album, Marshall, because <laughs> like coaching, yeah, you've done that. Books, yeah, you've done that. Movies, you've even done that. But do we have an album from you yet? I don't think we do. So, I'm uh, looking yeah. for the, uh, you know, Naz, ex Marshall Goldsmith video <laughs> coming out sometime soon. That would be something. Everyone that knows me back to your model would say too overwhelming and, you know, minor problem, uh, too hard, can't get there from here. Anyway, I don't know. I don't know. I can, I can see some magic. I've seen you work the microphone and there's something there. Now, you know, to me, the stuff that I do, and I like this next question, the stuff that I do, it always works. I mean, I right. teach people this stuff. I mean, I've got research from thousands and thousands of people. You do this stuff, you will get better. I mean, yeah. you know, my friend Alan Mulally, Alan was the CEO of Ford. He had this incredible process. Exactly. They did it. The stock skyrockets, right? Yeah. And then he leaves. Whoop, they quit doing it. Stock tanks. Have a new CEO. Stock tanks. Now they've hired a new CEO that's going back to do it again. The stock has doubled again. Duh. Right. <laughs> you know, okay. It all exactly. works. Alan and I are writing a book together. All the stuff he says works. All the stuff I say works. Hell, all the stuff you exactly. say works. Why don't people commit to do it? How do you know if you're ready to commit? Because... It, you know what I've learned in life? It doesn't work if you don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Write that down, people. Words of wisdom from Marshall. Hey, yeah. before I talk about commit, remind me when your book comes out. Oh, May. I'm coming out a new book in May. Now, the book with Alan will be later. My next book okay. is called The Earned Life. That'll be out in May. Perfect. I'm looking forward to that. Thank um, you. Yeah, you know, Marshall, I here's what normally happens. People come up with a goal. Yeah. They don't really interrogate it enough until they kind of test it. But even if they go through a process of drafting and testing, so they can look at that goal and they go, you know, this is thrilling and important and daunting. What feels like the natural next step is just to start trying to do stuff. And I think, and this is the second section of the book, and in some ways the deepest section of the book, I think there is something very powerful for you to really look at yourself and go, am I up for this? Can I really commit to this? And I think there are two related questions you want to ask. The first is this. Once you look at your goal, you ask yourself, what if I didn't do this? And I know this is kind of counterintuitive, but you go, what if I didn't do this? What are the prizes and the punishments of that decision? And you know what? There's immediate prizes for you not taking on your worthy goal, mostly centered around nothing much changes. So you stay right. comfortable. It's say familiar, you don't risk time, you don't risk money, you don't risk relationships, you don't risk reputation. Mm. There's a bunch of things that stay comfortably the same. And even if you're a little frustrated in your life or stressed out in your life, there's some part of you that goes, yeah, but I, at least I get it. <laughs> at least I know how it works. I know my position. Mm. So there are some prizes to not doing it. But it's really worth thinking about the punishment of you not doing it. What's the price you would pay? What's the price... The people whose work you do would affect would pay. What's the price all of us would pay? And there's a cost to you not having the courage to cross the threshold and begin that. And as you ask that question, you're trying to weigh up prizes and punishments if I don't do that. But then there's a second question to ask, which is similar but different. You want to ask yourself, if I fully committed to this, what are the prizes and punishments of this decision? If I really went, I'm all in. I'm making this decision. I'm going for this worthy goal. And the prizes are obvious. They're like, this is what you would get if you achieved your worthy goal. Yeah. So you'd get 
impact or notoriety or fame or money or making a difference in the world, whatever it is for you. But it also asks that question, which isn't asked very often. Well, what's at risk if you're really committed to this? What might you lose in terms of, again, money, time, <laughs> reputation, relationships, expectations of yourself, expectations others have of you? All of okay. that is at risk. And it's only by sitting with this and weighing up prizes and punishments for doing it and not doing it can you really get clear about whether you're ready to commit or not? You know, that is one thing I think that coaches are typically bad at and medical doctors are awful. I remember I, I was playing ball and I bent my finger and oh. I got something called baseball finger. Right. It was kind of bent down like that. Mm -hmm. so I read about it. Then I go to the doctor. So I'm, I'm, I was like in my 20s. And I said, I think I've got this baseball finger. The doctor said, yeah, that's right. You have the baseball finger. And I said, well, I read this book and it said, I'm supposed to like do this splint and do these things and all this. It was kind of a pain in the ass activities. <laughs> and if I did all that stuff, it would get better in about four or five months. So the doctor said, well, that's exactly what I was going to tell you. Now you go do all that stuff and then come back and see me. Right. I came back in four or five months and my hand is fine. I actually did all that stuff, which is very unusual for me because I'm using <laughs> discipline. But I did all that stuff. And then you know what the doctor said? What's that? He said, I'm amazed. Nobody ever does this. Right. You know what I'm thinking? What an ass. What an ass you are. I mean, right. you are glibly tell me what to do. Right. You know that 90% of the people aren't going to do it. You right. could care less. You could care less. I all agree. All you do is say, I gave you the right diagnosis. And about 90% of our medical system is, I give you the right diagnosis. I have no no faith you're going to do any of this stuff. Right, exactly. Yeah go, on, yeah, go on a diet and work out every day. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, what percent of people do that, right? People don't even take the medicine as prescribed. I know, exactly. I mean, there was a very yeah. famous um, story, I think it was in Fast Company some years ago, basically talking about people who had heart-threatening disease, had surgery, and basically the doctor said, look, we've saved your life now, but yeah. um, unless you change your lifestyle, you're, you're basically going to die <laughs> because this is not sustainable in terms of what your body can cope. Right. And less than one in eight was able to change the way that they lived their life, even though the consequence is death. Right. So the first thing that's to say is that just acknowledges how hard behavior changes. And that it's not as glib as just to say, look, so go and lose weight or exercise or eat differently or whatever it might be. But it also says that a diagnosis and a command to do stuff is useless unless you actually have a conversation around what's it going to really take for you to change. And I think that's right. what you're pointing to with doctors, which is like, it's not just an individual doctor, but there's a medical system that perhaps doesn't spend enough time going What's it going to take for you to start and finish this course of treatment, whether that's pills or finger exercises or eating healthily or whatever it might be? You know, one thing that I, I love about your book is you do deal with the issue of this is hard. Right. And it's not easy. And, and the other interesting reflection I had on your book is the concept of comfort. Mm -hmm. You know, comfort's a very fascinating concept because – to start with, the best coaching advice I ever got, I worked with Paul Hersey. I was making a lot of money. He called me in and he said, look, you're making a ton of money. Your clients are happy. You're running around selling days and you're never going to be the person you could be. Right. You're never going to be the person you could be. You're not writing. You're not stretching yourself. I'm not, in your terms, doing what's in this book. Right. He said, you're not being the person you could be and you never will if you don't change. Right. And I probably lived that out for eight years before I finally changed. Well, okay. what, what made you want to change? Because just as you said before, there's other people who might have heard that and they're like, yeah, but you know what? I'm going to stay in the comfort zone. What made you say, you know what? I'm going to take that on. I'm going to take step to the edge of my competence and confidence so that I can become the next version of Marshall Goldsmith. Well, a lot of it was luck. I got ranked purely by luck in the Wall Street Journal is one of the top 10 uh, executive educators in the world. I'm not saying that it'd be modest. It was just pure luck. And then I got to meet Francis Hesselbein, Peter Drucker, and they really inspired me 
to write, to think, to try to be more. Mm. And if I had to look at all the people who've helped me in life, they've given me a message. You can be more. You can be more. And they haven't said you can be more comfortable. No. Now, let me, I want you to get your reflections on this. 95% of all executive education, though, runs contrary to your book. The last thing they want to do is make people not comfortable. Executive education is, do you like the speaker? <laughs> is the speaker funny? And you and I are both funny. So we both yeah. get very good feedback. Let's hear it for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Yay. Yeah. 4.8 out of 5. Over right. and over again. 4.8, 4.8, right? Exactly. You're a very good speaker. I'm a very good speaker. The reality is people don't get better because they sit in a room and listening to speeches. Yeah. And, but what do we get paid for? Making people happy. They go to these exec ed programs. They love the speaker. Yeah. And then the food is tasty and the room was nice. Yeah. Now, the only people being trained are the speakers, <laughs> the cook, and the janitor because <laughs> they don't want to make the leaders uncomfortable. Well, that's exactly right. I mean, it's just the very nature of adult learning is trying to find the zone of discomfort, not too uncomfortable that you want to give up. But, you know, as they talk about it, being consciously incompetent, you know, is that scale of learning? It starts off unconsciously incompetent, which is that when you don't even know that you suck. <laughs> right. You get consciously competent, which is like, oh, man, this is awkward and difficult. And, you know, I'm, I realize I'm not very good at this. And I think as you get older, you, that you're in that zone increasingly less time because you can design your life to be mostly comfortable most of the time. Then you move up to being consciously competent. You, know, you still have to think about it, but you're, you're kind of, you're okay at it. And then unconsciously competent, which is kind of when it's in your bones. Learning happens in the consciously incompetent zone, which, you know, is, is an awkward place to be. But if you're a great educator, you're designing ways to put people into that zone because you know that it serves them. Even if they're like, I would rather sit at the table and just listen to you talk. You're like, no, no, for your sake, I'm committing to kind of push you a little bit because I know that's what's going to stick later on. You know, one thing I like about the book is you don't just have content. You actually have people talk about themselves and how does this apply to me? My theory in life is if I don't know how it applies to me, I don't know how it applies. I don't know how it applies at all. And and I find that when I try to apply things to myself, as you say, they're very tough. Yeah. And we're getting almost out of time. So the first is thank you so much for talking with me. Look, I love this guy. He's a wonderful person. He's a great thinker. He's a great. He's even coached me. You even coached me. I, I did. I did. I did. I coaching me. It was really good. He's even coached me. He's a great thinker. He's funny. He's irreverent. And he gets you to think. Now, in wrapping things up, what are some final reflections you'd like to share with everyone before we leave? Well, I think it's, you know, it's already January the 12th. And what that means is we've already hit what can, uh, um, oh, what's the name? Uh, it's an exercise app they call, we've already hit quitting day, which is when, you know, like somewhere like eight or nine days after New Year's Day, they're like, ah, oh, this is too hard, too difficult. You know what? I just, I, I thought I was going to make that resolution, but you know what? I'm just going to go back to what's normal. And what I'd say is that we still have 353 days left of 2022. And this is your chance to have an extraordinary year. So even though you're thinking to yourself, ah, I had such good intentions at the start of the year, it's still the start of the year. So don't give up on yourself, but say to yourself, you know, what's, what's something that matters to me? What's a goal that feels thrilling and important and daunting for me that can not only light me up and unlock my greatness, but can leave the world a bit better than you found it. You know, I love that. And in the immortal words of the rock group free, <laughs> don't wait. Don't, don't wait. wait. Hey, let's move before they raise the parking rate. There we go. I'm playing air ukulele in to accompany you on that, Marshall. <laughs> so, Michael, wonderful to work with you. You're a great guy. Buy the book. Tell them how to buy the book. Buy the book. Buy yeah, the book. you know what? It's at all the places that you normally buy books. But if you're looking for bonuses, howtobegin.com is a particularly good place to go and hang out because you'll find the book and you'll also find some other bits and pieces there as well. Howtobegin.com. Marshall, thank you for your guidance and your mentorship and your friendship. Oh, thank you so much. You're a wonderful person. Honored to know you. Thank you, Michael. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, everybody.
So that's the challenge in front of us, to replace an old habit, the advice-giving habit, with a brand new habit, staying curious a little bit longer. Because when you do that, you begin to empower people, not by giving them the answer, but by helping them find their own answer. Not by rescuing them, but by helping them find their own path. Not by holding on to control on everything, but by giving up some control and inviting others to step in and to step up. And all of that becomes possible when you tame your advice monster. Thank you.